Remember these great songs? Eminence Front and You Better You Bet by The Who, Stay With Me by The Faces, and Ichiku Park by The Small Faces, and many more. What do all these great songs have in common? They have in common my next guest, legendary drummer. Join us for this one, because this is going to be an absolute blast. We are going on the record with Kenny Jones right now. Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. This is the show where we bring you the musician story, and uh, I couldn't be more pleased to be introducing my next guest. You've heard the music and now hear their story, and you've definitely heard my next guest's music. He is British rock royalty. He's a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a founding member and drummer of the Small Faces, the Faces, the Who, and uh, with Paul Rogers and the Law. His latest book, his biography, is Let the Good Times Roll. Kenny Jones is on the record. Welcome, Kenny. It's nice to be here. Man, thank you for being here. I, I'd love to start with, uh, I mean, I think you've been really brave with talking about um, health stuff that's going on. How are, you, how are you just feeling physically these days? I feel 100%, yeah. No, I'm very, very lucky. I got caught my prostate cancer early. So I advise men to go and get tested. Literally, when they're around 40 years old, get tested. Yeah, and I, thank you for, for doing that and saying that. I think it's a, a brave thing. And then you've, you know, you've done that, and then you've started this whole project, uh, which is great, the Prostate Project, and now Rod Stewart's involved. And you know, how did all that come about, please? Well, I was asked to, to raise funds for the, the new local Surrey Hospital. And so I chose a, a, a gig that we could do. I was invited, well, I was asked to do a gig at Went Wentworth Golf Course. It's a very famous golf course in, in Surrey. And they said, could you get uh, the faces to do a gig? And we could, it's a private gig. Um, and we're going to invite very wealthy people to donate to the charity. And I said, yeah, luckily enough, they asked me this time last year, shortly before Christmas. And Rod and I and Woody always get together before Christmas. So I said, I'll let you know after Christmas. So, uh, so when we met for a Christmas bash, I said to, to Rod and, and Ronnie, look, you know, I've been asked to do this at Wentworth, uh, would you like to do it? And they said, yeah, great, no problem. That's amazing. So you guys usually get together for Christmas and it, as we're talking, it's mid-November now, so you, you'll be getting together for a, a, just a private personal jam? Well, Rod usually has a Christmas bash at his house every, every year, so. Very nice. And then sing some carols and yeah. bring the grandchildren and just generally have a bit of fun. That's amazing. That's, yeah. that's so cool to hear. Is it ever a full set, a, a full band of rock and Christmas music? Uh, no, it's always carols. It's always the, carols. the traditional sort of Christmas carols. That's amazing. Carols. That's awesome. You know, I, I started reading your book, Let the Good Times Roll, and I'm glad to hear health-wise it's all good. Thank you for it. Yeah, look, see? Awesome. And people can get that wherever books are sold, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was amazed to hear you were like 14, 15 when the small faces started hitting it big. Yes. I mean, we, we were a band before that. I mean, I started, I, I, well, I remember being, I just left school. Before I knew it, I, was, I had a hit record in the charts. I mean, I, we had a hit record in the charts. I just turned 16. And so I like just I was 15, and then I had a hit record in the charts. And my, my feet haven't touched the ground since. Yeah. It's now 71 years later. It's incredible. Does it feel like a lifetime ago? No, it feels like I'm still on that train, that long, that lucky train. Of, I don't know where it's going to take me next. It's an amazing train, right? What was the first single that hit the charts, that had the hit record? It's the first song was called What You Gonna Do About It, written by Mort Schumann and Sonny Samuel, Ian Samuel. And, and what did that do? Uh, where did that start you guys well, going? That, that, that's where we learned a lot about the record industry, see, because in those days, you had to sell a lot of records to get in the charts. Now you can sell one or two and you've got to hit record, but so everything's online now. But right. we didn't have that in those days, it was, you had to go and do it the hard way. So we, we got Don Arden, who was our manager then, that's Sharon Arden's dad. Um, he manages us and he gave us some money to go into certain record shops and buy sort of 10 or 15 singles of the what you're going to do about it at the time. Everyone was doing it in rock and roll. 
Yeah, there were a lot of covers back then, right? Yeah, to, to actually go and create orders. Yes. Yeah, because it's very hard to write original music, right? But it went to, anyway, it came, came in the charts, uh, I think somewhere around, got in the top 14, it was, I think it went to 10, I think, I can't remember where it got to, but it was a hit. That's amazing. What was that like for you, 15, 16, and, and in your home, in your family? What were your folks thinking and feeling about all of this? Well, my, my mum and dad, to be honest, a few years later, when I, I, was, I was sort of um, had more hit records, and I caught them scratching their head going, what have we given birth to here? <laughs> Very confused they were. Because right. I'm an only child, you see. I was sport with love and affection. Okay. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. So they were, they were cool with it. They were like, oh, they this were is really great. Cool with it. They, were, they became very proud and wondered what was going to happen to me next. I mean, the, the, the worst thing about having a hit record at 16 is you, I could drive a car, I could drive a truck, because my dad was a lorry driver and he, he taught me how to drive when I was eight years old. Wow. Basically, um, I, I could drive, but I couldn't, I couldn't drive my own car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had money to buy it, so... You had the money to buy it. Yeah, I had the money to buy it. And then uh, yeah, it was a mini. It was always a second hand mini. Tell me a little bit about the beginnings for you as far as influences, drumming, any uh, special teachers that came in your life. How did you yeah, even I, start on the drums? I've never had a drum lesson in my life, okay. uh, which um, I kind of, I picked up things from watching people. Um, one of my favorite drummers was the Shadows drummer, Tony Mann he started out with as a drummer and then Brian Bennett you know, I thought how can how can another Brian Bennett top turn him in of course when Brian Bennett joined the band my god he, I was just in love with him he was such a great drummer he's, he's, a, he's a jazz drummer as well so and um, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing <laughs> there you that go really is true. that really is true so yeah. when I play rock and roll I, I can't because I grew up I learned the only records we had in the in the house was uh, 378 records. One of them was the theme tune to Rawhide. The other one was 12 Street Rag. And the other one was uh, uh, Blue Moon. Amazing. Yeah. So I learned to play to those three records. Is that right? That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. What was your first drum kit? My first drum kit was, funny enough, I, I've still got it. And I, I, I didn't know what happened to it. I, I, I'd given it to one, Ronnie Lane's best friend, I think, and he moved to Cornwall. And then, I mean, sort of 40 years later, 50 years later, his son called me up and said, um, Dad's got, still got your drum kit. It was a five minute one, he's got it in the cupboard. He said, he won, if you make a donation to um, multiple sclerosis, Ronnie Lane's charity, uh, would you like the kit? I said, yeah, no problem, that's great. So he brought, he brought it down, opened the, opened the van door, and I saw my drum kit for the first time since, since I was 13 years old. Wow. And I, my knees crumbled, I went, oh no. I never thought I'd see it again. So, the drum kit found me. That's incredible. You know, you know, the same drumsticks and everything on it. You know, it's unbelievable. Is that right? Amazing. And and what was it? What kind of? Uh... It was, it was a, a, an Olympic set, and it had calf, calf skins on it, real calf skins. And um, uh, uh, it sounded wonderful. It just worked well, to me. It did, but the, the cymbals were a bit tinny, but I didn't know in those days. Right. It I, I really love your drumming. I think it's underrated. And one of the things that uh, I think is underrated is like you do a lot of hi-hat stuff, yeah. whether splashes or barks, whatever you want to call them. Where did you pick that up? Well, I picked up, I have to go back right back to the beginning and say one of the records I learned to play drums to was 12 Street Rag. Real sort of ragtime stuff. And that was great to learn to play to because I had a swing. So I swing everything I play, fours and everything. So when I play fours, I don't go, I'm going to have to make a noise now. Most people go down strokes. And I go. There's a swing there. Yes. That's how I play. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a jazz drummer or jazz-influenced drummer? I'm a, I'm a jazz-influenced drummer. I, yeah. I, I, I love playing jazz, uh, free form of that. And I did a lot of session work when I first joined, when I was in the, the first band, the Small Faces. And I did a lot of big band stuff. So it really did me a, a great start into, into discovering different moods, different ways of playing, discovering myself and my own style. 
Can we talk about some of that being in the studio? What was that like as a teenage kid going in the studio for the first time? Terrifying. I bet. I mean, there were these strange people watching me, and I, you know, it's kind of weird. Well, and the first session we ever did was in Regent Sound, Denmark Street. It was the first recording studio. But a lot of people have recorded the, the big hits in there in the 50s. And what do you remember recording? Oh, it, was a, it was one of our own songs that, that when I was in a band called The Outcast, our first band, me and Ronnie Lane was, uh, were in the band as well. And um, we went into this, into Regent Sound and recorded. I think three songs and I, I don't know what happened to them they're around somewhere and this was year 1960 it's got, it's got to be 1961 or two so wow 1961 or two what what was the cost of that do you have any idea do you know what i wasn't into money in those days. i knew it was expensive we all had to chip in to do it okay so, got it. i think it was wasn't very dear but it was, you know, yeah Let's keep talking about the studio, please, because one of the legends of in the studio that you worked with, both with the Faces and the Who, was Glenn Johns. Yes, and- he's, he's fantastic. I mean, I, when I first, when we first, funny enough, we worked together all, all my recording life, and he's, he's been, he was an engineer when we first met him, and then, he, then years later, uh, he became a, a producer. But he contributed so much to to us being, this, we got to know him really well as a band. He got to know us. And we, so we had this great rapport between us. And so and he was kind of directing us a little bit, even though we were producing our own songs. You know, it was great. So it's, for me, it's been, a, it's been a, the, a producer. Yeah. Yeah. What were the main similarities and differences between your time in the studio with him, with the faces and the who? Well, uh, it was funny enough, the, yeah, because Glenn was also recording The Faces and The Who, wow. with me playing drums. So I had, I had a great drum sound. Cause, and I said to Glenn, Glenn and I got together, we get together a little bit here and there. So last year, last summer, we, we, he invited me over to his house for a, a meal. And I just said to her, look, I've just finished the book and stuff like that. I said, and there's a bit in there, they keep asking me, how many mics do I use on the drums? I said, I said, well, I, I think I only use, didn't only use two overheads and, and a close mic on a snare. And my, that's it. He said, no, I only use one overhead. Wow. And, and uh, one, one on the snare, and that's it. That's Based it. Up. He said, I said, well, how did you get my sound? I said, wasn't there a little room downstairs? I remember a little room downstairs with a speaker in it and a mic in front of that, which gave a, a sort of echo sound to, to the snare drum. He said, no. I don't remember that at all. He said, what? I said, I said, he said, no. I said, well, how did you get my drum sound? And he said, it's huge. You did it. He said, it's your drum kit. I got the ambient sound of the room. With yeah. Your sound was, that was it. The way you tuned your drums, and that's it. Right. I went, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's definitely you, Kenny, right? Definitely one of the great, you. One of the great things, because I did a lot of session work outside the um, uh, band. So and Glenn was always booking me for sessions as well. So, and I, uh, one of the things that happened was, uh, well, is it in the small faces, he, he plays, plays a song, we, we, he recorded a song saying, I think, come and have a listen, you know, God, that's a great track. Went in a, and when I went in to the control room to listen back, the, um, he put an effect on, I did a bit more echo or something like that, or a delay. And I said, Glenn, that's fantastic. I said, I don't hear that in my cans. I said, but I need to. Le- I need to hear that. If I can hear that, I can. I can adjust my time into it. And he went, "All oh, right." So from then on in, we learned this in the very early days. So I, whatever effect he was going to put on, it was in my cans. So I could then go, rather than ba ba da ba 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 ba. It helps. It definitely helps to hear things, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. it must. Yeah. So I learned a lot. That it was a painful going to do sessions. With other, in other studios with uh, alien, alien um, engineers yeah. or producers, because I was so used to them. Right, I bet. Then, then they soon got the, they soon got the measure of me, and I said, "No, the drum sounds crap. Give me another one." <laughs> now, was he also on the session when you? Because you, some people don't know this, but you were on the record. It's only rock and roll by the Stones, right? You, no. you played on that song, right? 
Yes, I played on the song, and that happened by accident. Um, I don't, if anyone knows London, there's Richmond Park, and I used to live on a gate on one of the gates of Richmond Park, and it was Kingston Gate um, on Kingston Hill. And Ronnie Wood lived on the other side of the park, almost opposite me, and that was on Richmond Gate. And Ronnie had this, um, uh, he put a studio in the, in the basement. And so he had a lot of gizmos in there and things and new things to play with every time he went around there. I gave him a drum kit, which is the worst thing I could ever do, have done. Because <laughs> as soon as I got one foot into bed, I get a call saying, Kenny, we haven't got a drummer. So, oh no, no. I said, oh, I won't be long. But then in those days, I, they closed the park. I, I could get to him his, into this place in, in about five minutes during the day. And when I had to go around the outside of the park, I was, it was a terrifying drive because I'd had a couple of drinks and I didn't want to get caught by the old bill. <laughs> so, and then I get, I get into, the, I get into, the, in, into his house. It's called The Wick. Funny enough, Pete Townsend's bought that house and he, he lives there now. Wow. Small world. So I, know, I know every inch of that house. And before Ronnie bought it, he bought it from the actor, John Mills. Yeah, and we were finding Winchesters in every car, in you know, cowboy guns and stuff, <laughs> in the covers and stuff. All kinds of props. It's amazing. It's amazing. I thought you were going to say that Ronnie Wood started playing the drums. That's why you got him a drum set, right? Oh, no. Uh, yeah, no. no he, he got the drum set. And then, um, then he called me up and said, we haven't got a drummer. So, oh, okay. So, I'll drive around. I get there. And you, you never know who's going to be there. I mean, one day I got there, Dylan would be there. So, I'll play around there. And that was that. And the next day, it'd be clapped in or someone like next, whenever it got up. I said, I'm kind of used to it by then. Right. And then, it was only jamming and pissing about, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then this one time, it called up, Kenny, we haven't got a drummer. All right, I'm on the way, Ronnie. So I'd get there. And Mick Jagger was there. Okay. So, was, Ronnie had just all this new equipment, this outboard equipment in, in, in the control room. So he's running around being the engineer, testing. It was only the three of us in there. So we, we didn't see Ronnie, it was, it was so me, me, and Jack, me and Mick on our own. And we're just playing around with this little riff and just doing stuff. And it was because it's about two o'clock in the morning now. Amazing. And so we, and Mick said, oh, Kenny, play it like that. I went, I said, no, it's too late. I'll play it like this. I said, anyway, it's only rock and roll. He said, but I like it. And so he started, <laughs> like, so he's jamming around his song, which is going around in his head all the time. Yeah. His idea. Um, his idea. Anyway, so. And we just played Sunny Rock and Roll. We were just messing around with that. It's and amazing. Ronnie, Ronnie was actually recording everything we did. That's crazy. Ronnie came in and said, keep playing, keep playing. And he set us all up. And then he said, right, I'm going to take it. So he took it. So it was only guitar and drums and me and Mick playing. Then Ronnie, Ronnie came back in and overdubbed the bass and then the guitar and stuff like that. Wow. That's how it started. And I've, I just left it there. I went, good night, folks. See you later. See you another time. Went back and got into bed. Got all well. And then um, it was only a few months later, I heard that they, the Stones had gone into, uh, into the studio with the demo that Mick and I had done, Ronnie, and they tried everything to, re to recreate the feel. Oh. And they couldn't do it, yeah. some of them. So they, they came up with a bright idea, let's keep, it, let's keep it the way it is. And just, we, they just overdubbed little bits and pieces. Right? And so yeah. th then I heard it was going to be a single so straight away, as soon as I had on the album, it's a single, I called, I called um, Charlie up. I said, Charlie, I said, I understand I'm on your record. I, I, I didn't mean to do that. I never intended to do that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he said, no, no, it's fine, Kenny, don't worry. It sounds like me anyway. So, <laughs> only, only Charlie was so, be, could yeah. be so gracious. Yeah. About two amazing drummers on the same record. So he was cool with it, and um, I'm hoping you get a royalty or something from that? No, I got a gold disc. Yeah, okay, you got a gold That's disc. Right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Consolation prize there. That's pretty good too, right? Yes, I'm the only place I have to be. Only one, one is only pleased to be of assistance. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, well, thank you for your contribution to it all. It's, uh, it's really right. amazing. So, so Glenn Johns wasn't in there. Um, it, it was just you and Ronnie and Mick. Um, any other Glenn Johns sort of memories or stories that come to mind for you? Oh, there's quite a few. I mean, uh, I, I'm, the sessions I did with Glenn was, uh, I can't remember how many people I did. I, I did an album with, with him, uh, Joan Armour Trading. Mm. I, I played on her first album, okay. Show Me Some Emotion. Wow. And that was great as well. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's amazing. I also, also played on Bright Eyes. 
I'm bright sorry. Eyes. I'm sorry, Kenny, on whose? Bright, bright eyes. Bright, bright eyes. Yeah. Bright eyes. Yeah. I don't know that. Simon and Garfunkel, one of them anyway. Oh, Simon and Garfunkel. Okay, got it. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Um, if I could switch gears with you a little bit, can we talk about your book and what was the inspiration and what was the process? I mean, I talk with a lot of folks. I mean, you're a great drummer, uh, but I talk with other musicians. It's hard writing a book, right? What was it like for you? Well, I, I was years ago when I used to do a lot of interviews and stuff like that, when I first started, and, uh, and I didn't realize I'd lived a lot of life at such a young age. So when I did an interview, some of the journalists said quite a lot, you should write a, an autobiography, you should write a book. Yeah. And I said, yeah, great. So I got fired up about it a few times. And then I thought, I started thinking about it, make some notes and stuff. And I thought, no, something feels wrong about this. I said, I'm only, I'm only, I'm only 30 years old. And they asked me to write a book, an autobiography about the, my life. And I haven't lived long enough to write a book. So I, I parked it, I put it to one side. It was only years later when I got prostate cancer, or, or cancer for the second time, because I broke cancer in 1984. Okay. So that was, dealt with that one. So the second cancer came along, prostate cancer. And by this time I was approaching 70 years old. So I thought, you know what, I better write that book before I, before I pop off. Right, right. So you, that's amazing then. I didn't realize that you've survived two cancers. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad and I'm glad you're healthy. Can I ask, you know, I've been doing this new segment of my show called the Rock Therapy Show, talking about music and mental health and that kind of stuff and how just having conversations with people around that. Can you talk about how did that affect you emotionally? Did you get down? Well, funny enough, the first time I had uh, 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 thyroid cancer, it was, and luckily it was contained in my thyroid, so that's the best thing about it. So it never spread anywhere. So, but it frightened the life out of me. I was I so scared because the first time, when, you've, someone, when you're told you've got cancer at such a young age, you know, I couldn't believe it. I, mean, it's, it's, I was in the Who as well. So. You were in the Who at the time this happened. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. Wow. And so I thought, well, my God, uh, what do I do with this? And suddenly... I kind of jogged into the hospital. Well, when I saw, over here, the specialists are called Mr. They're better than doctors or professors. So Misters. I said, I can't have a Mr. operating on me. So I want a, I want a proper doctor. Yeah. So anyway, so, so the Mr. came in. Mr. Chow Street, his name was. And funny enough, he went on to be the Lord Mayor of London. Is that right? Yeah. Little did I know the Lord, I can always say now, it's a bit funny, it's been <laughs> after, uh, but my throat's been cut by the Lord Mayor of London. Right. <laughs> so you had uh, a surgical procedure, you had some, the cancer removed? Yes, I did, but what happened was the, the, the Mr. Charles Street, in his office, he said to me, he said, I, I, once he told me, I, the whole room filled up with, with, with water, mm. uh, like, like a shock, oh, and then slowly, he was kept, kept talking to me, and I couldn't hear a word he was saying. And suddenly the water decline came down and I could hear what he was saying. Yeah. And that's when it, like, the reality hit me. And then I, I said, well, he said, he said, I'm afraid you have an adenoma. I said, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> he, said, he kept looking at me, pan face, just staring at me. I said, what's an adenoma? And he said, an adenoma is cancer. Mm. I went, oh, no. So he said, are you going anywhere? I said, well, I go every year to Miami with my, my, my sons and, and kids, you know, and just watch the polo and stuff. He said, I said, Come. he said, we're going to have to operate. He said, well, I said, he said, when are you going? I said, well, next week. He said, he said, well, um, let, let's put it this way. I said, can I, can, can I do it after, well, after the holiday? And he said, he said, let's put it this way. If you were my son, I'd have you in tomorrow. I said, now I'm now adopted. I'm coming in tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So that, what I remembered was, it was fine. I jumped into hospital. I had this great nurse there, took my mind off it straight away. She's an Irish nurse, looked fantastic. And she had the biggest tits I've ever seen. So I was, <laughs> I was, in, I was in heaven so, instead of in hospital. Anyway, so she took my mind off the opera or whatever was, whatever was wrong with me. So then, what happened with that? Well, and then I've lost my place now. Uh, yeah, so uh, then the doctor came around. He said, we're going to operate... Um, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, so well, I'm going to be in early in the morning to give you a premium. I said, "Well, what's that?" For? He said, "It just it just relaxes you." Okay. Well, I said, "Okay." 
So the next morning came around and I put the pre-med in and I swear to God, to this day, it never worked. No. So I, was, I, was, whoa, I was wired, very wired. Then, so, then he said to me, right, he said, okay, we're going to operate shortly. He said, but I need you to sign this paper. I said, what is it? He said, it's, it's, it's only to say that if we find that the cancer is spread and it's spread to other organs, like your vocal cords, we, 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 we ask you for, for your permission to take out your vocal cords and, and anything else. And I went, that's when, I, that's when it really hit me. I thought, that's when the shock hit me. I went, oh, no. It's not like as if you could have your neck out and your head, your head sort of lower back on it. Right, right. So I, uh, then I remember them coming around to get me and wheeling me down to the theatre. And all I could see in this old Victorian house in Harley Street was this, was the plumbing. Because <laughs> on the ceiling, it was all the air vents and plumbing pipes and God knows what. Well. Okay. We're getting there and stuff. Then he said, get to the theater and he said, right, I'm going to count, put the, put the uh, anesthetic again. And he said, I want you to count backwards. And I went, one, well, well, come. Yeah. Right. yeah, you were out, right? And then so, I woke up. Yeah. Amazing. And, and obviously for anybody getting that news, the anxiety, the water rises yeah. tremendously. The, the reason I went, I told you all that is because when I heard I had prostate cancer, it's like, Oh God, it's fine. It's, I, I can accept it straight away. Yeah, yeah, and it sounds like you—you you know, obviously not great news. It's not like winning the lottery, but you—you you knew some of the process. You could manage it, and now you're using some of that to do good works in the world with the yeah, process. I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer in heal thyself. So send these messages down to all your cells. You're the master of your own destiny. You're the master of your own body. Right. So send these messages down to all the through your cells into these rotten bits that are inside the aliens inside your body and say we don't like a neck get out right. <laughs> it, it works for me right it, it's clearly worked so you're you're doing something right and i'm glad you're okay i'm sure, I'm sure the surgeon had something to do it as well well yeah sure <laughs> well yeah we got to get help as well right nothing wrong with that when we need it so yeah. Um, you know, the other thing that's fascinating about you, and I, I, I want to, I know you've probably talked about this, uh, you know, a ton, um, but I think, you know, your time with The Who feels underrated to me. And I think you came in with an absolute, almost impossible situation for anybody. Yeah. To take, to time, take. It, was, it was an impossible situation. Yeah. But see, the guys were, I, funny enough, Pete and I had worked together on demos and stuff, a bit like Ronnie, you know. And I did lots of sessions with, with, with Pete and, and I did lots, a lot of sessions with, with Emerson. Because people used to book us and I never knew who was going to be on the session. And so it, John would turn up and I'd go, oh, John, how are you doing? And that was that. So, so I knew everybody quite well, you know. And we toured Australia and Japan. And also, we, not Japan, we uh, toured Australia. Uh, years ago we got thrown out of Australia we caused so much havoc <laughs> Keith Moon was a great friend of mine so and he was always playing jokes on me but he would never take the mickey out of me he'd never take the piss out of me he was a great guy and because he respected me as a drummer and I respected him and so we had that course of drumming respect you know nothing like that so tell me a little bit of the difference between you know because I've heard he was a great practical joker as well uh, with Keith, but he never took the piss out of you. What does that mean versus uh, practical joking? Well, let's put it this way. Okay, a couple of things that happened to me over the years. When we <laughs> toured Australia, he, uh, Keith called out and said, "Called my room and said, Kenny, uh, fancy going to the bar?'" I said, "Yeah, great." So, okay, great. So we, we both of us like to drink. So, so I said, "Okay, right." So I, he said, "Come up to my room." So I went up to his room. And so he opened the door, and I'm, I couldn't help but notice about eight to nine, ten drums, snare drums, all lined up on the floor. And I said, I said, what are they for? What are you going to do with them? He said, I'll show you what we'll do with them. So I picked one up, right, went to the window, and threw it out the window. <laughs> I went, oh, no. Don't forget, we're in the mid we're in middle of Melbourne, overlooking, look, overlooking the high street down the We're about five stories up. And you're in the faces at this point, correct? I was in the small faces. Actually. Small faces, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And one night we chopped the bill, next night they chopped the bill. Okay. They've been on like that. So we looked out the window and saw this snare drum bouncing up and down, rolling down <laughs> Melbourne High Street, all falling to bits and gone no top. And we thought, we'd better leg it out of it. We'd get out of here straight away. So we went straight to the bar. That's unbelievable. Another time, another time, 
we were in um, uh, where were we now? Somewhere oh, it's near in Scotland, and um, we um, uh, it's on, we did a lot of touring in in England and, and Europe together as well. So we got to know each other really well. It's like being in one band. So uh, he said, "I've got these." I got these plastic legs. I said, oh yeah. He said, well, let, we'll go to the next gig, right? And you can, um, we'll just have a bit of a joke because Keith had a, a white Rolls Royce, typical Keith, you know. And it, right it, behind the Rolls Royce grill, he had a speaker and a microphone inside and a little lamp. And so <laughs> just to find these ladies, old ladies with their shopping. <laughs> and then, to scare them. Yeah, that we, now, we're in, now we're in Edinburgh High Street, stuck in a traffic jam, the buses are all, one bus was coming this way, and, and we're going the other way. And the white rose was, and so he shouted, put the microphone, he's going, and, and, and dangling out these plastic legs, you know, and saying, "Right, right, 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 help!" So oh one, one guy, one guy stopped his bus and jumped out of his cab to try and help. We like, just drove off. And when we get outside Edinburgh, the police came on us when we filled up with petrol. Well, yes, yeah, sorry, guess. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we, we filled up with petrol, <laughs> and uh, the, the police came out of nowhere, and we told them what had happened. They said they, they let us off and said, oh, "Don't do anything. Don't play any, play any more practical jokes." <laughs> that was that. Then another time, because uh, I never knew what was going to happen with Keith. It was all the things that were funny. They weren't that bad, you know. So I'm in my room, and uh, and then I thought I could hear this sort of noise rustling noise and it was coming from you know when you go to your room there's always a desk there something like built into the wall and then there's a little chair in front of it and a sort of hollow bit underneath you could put your legs um and so i, I thought it's coming from there so i thought i got on my knees and i'm just listening and listening and it's getting louder and louder this rustling noise i thought they must have rats or mice or something so i watched it and got louder and louder and louder and I, now i'm getting concerned and then suddenly the wall started to move. <laughs> I thought, shit, it's moving. So there must be big rats here. So, <laughs> so I was just about to leg out of the room and suddenly this head pokes through the wall. And it's Keith. <laughs> How's your drink there, boy? <laughs> it's great. He had smashed through the wall, the other side of the wall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't realize he's in the room next door to me. <laughs> It's crazy. And, mm. and these and many other reasons are the reasons you guys got kicked out of Australia, it sounds like, right? So. Well, some of those reasons. You know, <laughs> funny enough, it wasn't our fault, really. It was, it was the, an Australian band's fault, it wasn't ours. Ah, somebody else's fault on this but We one. did cause havoc when they, when they tried to accuse us of stuff we never did. <laughs> so they kicked us off the aeroplane. We got off the aeroplane at gunpoint. Really? Yeah. What, what did they accuse you of? Well, what it was... In, in, in Australia, the flights you took in those days, you had to, um, you, you weren't allowed to drink alcohol on, on the internal flights. And so the, 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 we had an Australian band opening the show for us. And so they, we didn't know this, but they'd smuggled in their own booze on the, on the, and up the, we were all tired from partying the night before, we were collapsing, we were asleep. And then suddenly the, um, uh, Paul Jones was on the, was a, a solo artist. Do you know Paul? I, man for I, man. Oh yeah, sure. No man for man. Yes. Well, he's released a single on his own, and he was promoting this one. And um, Paul's very posh. Very, very, very sort of like IT party. That sort of thing. I can't even speak that posh. Yeah. And he said uh, uh, the aerostats came with a trolley, uh, serving coffee and sandwiches and whatever drinks, and she so walked straight past Paul. I'm, I'm awake anyway. I could see what happened. So Paul said, excuse me, excuse me, I, I, I want a cup of coffee. And she ignored him. So he said, so I put the light thing up there for attention. And he, she came back and said, what did, he said I, want my, I want my cup of coffee. I paid my ticket and all that. You've got your booze. You, you stick to that. She got, the, she got upset. Yeah. And so then Paul said, look, I paid my ticket. I want my coffee. This was getting louder and louder. That woke Mooney up as well. So Mooney going, oh. <laughs> yeah, we want coffee. We want our coffee. So that, now the road crew were wo woken up and everybody's, now we all want our coffee. So we're banging right on the, on the, <laughs> on the floor of the airplane. 
<laughs> so there's a lot of us banging on there and just saying, we want our coffee. We, uh, <laughs> and that was it. So, so the, the aerosist said, I'm going to have to get, if you don't shut up, I'm going to have to get the captain. So we got louder and louder. So the captain came out and said, if you don't pipe down, he said, I'm going to have to divert uh, to another airfield, which I think was Melbourne. Okay. I think. So we said, oh, I got louder. Said, Let's get our coffee. We're not going to stop until we get our coffee. The captain came out again and said, right, I'm out. I've got to divert and get you guys arrested. So we diverted the plane to Melbourne, wherever, wherever it was, I keep forgetting. I think it was Melbourne. Though. And he yeah. said, so it was one in the days where these airports were really small. They don't have these sort of galleyways and hydraulic step off the plane into the building. Yeah. So the, the, the aircraft was parked, the ladder comes down, and then from the aeroplane, so, wow. and, and then, uh, so we, we then um, walked down, uh, there's two uh, guys with, two police with machine guns at the bottom. Yikes. So we all walked up like that. <laughs> so, so, so funny. Then we went in, into, there's always a, the guy who's in charge of the whole airport. So we went in there and then we told him what had happened. Yeah. And he said, well, it sounds like it wasn't your fault. So this is what we've been trying to say. <laughs> you know. And, and so, so then, then the, the, we got a public apology from the guy in the airport and from, from the captain and from the airline itself. <laughs> but by the time the news hit England, it was the rock stars let, 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 let the side down, let England down. Terrible people, God knows what. So we got a bad name anyway. And, and did you ever get your coffee? No. <laughs> <laughs> this whole crisis could have been averted if they, if she just would have given you the coffee, right? All because of a cup of coffee. All because of a cup of coffee. It's amazing. Oh yeah. man, I love hearing these stories, Kenny. Thank you for for sharing them. That's all right. the, the other thing that I did not realize until I was reading more and did research was. You were with Keith the night before he he died. Yeah, yeah no, it's spooky. Eh? It is spooky. Can you can you <laughs> talking, talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I was, I was I was storming a band with uh, Glenn Johns. Well, jo Glenn Johns was putting a transatlantic band together. There was half American and half English, and it was very much like a like England meets the Eagles sort of thing. It was, it was great. A guy called Bill Lamb was a singer, a real songwriter. He was great. It's really good. So. Got along really well with him. It was a great band we were putting together. There was a uh, a girl in the band as well. She was a great singer. Um, so it was really great. Um, and we were signed. We were just about to sign to Atlantic Records in those days for I think it was about a million and a half dollars, which is not was a lot of money in those days. Absolutely. This is going back. What time was it? Nineteen seventy-six, I think. Well, and I know Keith died in 78, right? Yes, he died in 78, so it was before, yeah. it was before then, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's around about that time, same, so yeah. months ago. Well, it might be 77. Um, then, so, um, yeah, I've lost my plot now. Hang on, I just want to remember my space where I was. That's fine. We were talking about Keith and uh, the yeah. night. Oh, yeah, so, uh, that's right. So, I, uh, Paul McCartney had, had uh, the premiere of his uh, Buddy Holly film, That'll be the day. Was it that'll be the day? No. Can't be, it might have been. I think, um, it w I think it was. Yeah. So it was on the day I arrived back from, from uh, America, visiting the, the other half of the band. So when I, came, when I landed, I came straight from the airport, straight into the, the premiere. What I thought was going to be the premiere. It, was, it wasn't really. It was, it, was, it, was, it was the premiere, but it was straight into the pool does things in mysterious ways. He had, he had the after party, after, after, uh, as if you, you know when you have the premiere, then you'll leave the premiere and go to a party. Yeah. We had the party, so uh, <laughs> a place called Pemberton Park uh, in London, and we walk, it's a short walk to, to Leicester Square, Odeon, to watch the film. Okay. So we had the party, and then, so <laughs> in, the, in the party, the pre-party, um, I found myself sitting with me, Keith, uh, Paul McCartney, uh, Paul's brother, who was with the scaffold at the time, and David Frost, who became Sir David Frost. And so we're sitting there all talking to each other, and then uh, Keith, Keith said, well, what are you up to? I said, I told him, I just got off a plane, I've just got this new band, put, put it together with Glenn Johnson. I told him all about it, I said, great. I said, how are you then? How's your health and all that? He said, 
She said, great, I've never, I've never, I can't have a drink anymore. I've never had a drink, I've no drugs. I said, oh, great, because you look great. He said, yeah, no, I feel, feel a lot better. I said, well, okay, great. He said, if I have a drink now, I have to, I have to it makes me violently ill with the pills I'm taking. That's it. Generally talking around that. Then we went, all legged it to, walked around the corner to the Odeon, Leicester Square, watched the film. It's now about, um, I don't know, one thirty in the morning, something like that. And um, we all said, said goodnight to each other. I said goodnight, Keith, goodnight, everyone. And I went back to, I used to live in Hampstead at that time, in London. And then I woke up the next day, I turned the TV on. And the news came on shortly afterwards, and it said, Keith Moon has been found dead with a drug overdose. I thought, oh no, what's he done now? Because he's like, it's got to be a practical joke, because that's what it's all about. And the, I didn't realise it was true. Right. Funny enough, he's, he's, he's staying in the same flat that Mama Cass was in, that she died in. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Yeah. And um, that was it. So. Hmm. Yeah, very sad. I mean, what was that like for you? You guys were friends. You saw him. It was, it was heartbreaking, because it was, I mean, especially seeing someone that you knew quite well the night before. And the next day they're dead. It's kind of weird, you know. And I, I had a lot of exciting things happening for me at the time. So I'm on a fairly upbeat. And to be brought down with the death of a good friend in such a tragic way was terrible. But it was an, I've got to tell you, it's only when I joined you when they asked me to join the band. That's another story entirely. But when I joined the band, uh, you know, I found out exactly what happened to him. I said, well, you know, they, but what happened was Keith left the left the party, the premier, where we say goodnight to each other, he'd gone to the flat, uh, taken his nighttime pill, right, and that was it, went to bed. Woke up a couple of hours later, thought it was morning, and took the other took the morning pill. Mm. And these pills apparently if you take them that close together, it slows your heart down. So it's an accidental Yeah. Should I go with this? Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's an accidental one. So I try and put Point out to many people as I can because he didn't do it on purpose. He wasn't. He wasn't taking drugs. He was taking drugs to stay alive. Yeah, that's yeah. That. yeah. He was actually working on it. You know, yeah. there there probably could have been many more times when he was partying that he uh, he could have passed, but he was actually working. So it's very it's just tragic. Well, I, I would have given anything to <laughs> change anything uh, if I could have. I would never. I I would much rather not have joined her and Keith be alive. I really would. Of course. When you were approached by them, was it John who approached you, John Entwistle, who asked you to be well, in the Who? I'll tell you how it was, because Keith Moon and I shared the same drum drum tech. Okay. I'm it in those days, but drum yeah. tech. Yeah. To be polite. It's fine. Technician. <laughs> so, and you know, I, I would say, I have great respect for my drum techs, yeah. uh, drum roadies, whatever. Because yeah. I, I always say, I'm only as good as my drum roadie, my drum technician. I say, because it sets my kit up and I'm happy, I can play it with my eyes shut, God knows what. That's, it's, it's very difficult to do those sort of things. Yeah. And so it's got to be spot on. So then I have great respect for the drum technician. I guess I wondered, you know, the other thing I was thinking about was, I mean, this is your friend, also Keith Moon. You were friends with all of the Who in the band. Yeah. yeah. This was only two months after Keith died that you joined the band. And, yes. and to know, you know, a very different style of playing. Did you ever have any reservations about, geez, I'm not sure. I Yeah, of course I did. I, I, I had massive reservations about it because I didn't particularly want to be in that position. You know, was, what happened was I, I, um, I'd only just, Keith had his funeral up in Highgate, not very far from where I lived. And I didn't want to go be part of the charade, so I took a little poem and a little wreath up to, before anyone got there, put it there and said my little piece, said my goodbye to Keith, and I left before anyone got there. And so that was that, and I put it out of my mind. We, we, uh, we shared the same drum technician, a guy called Bill Harrison. Okay. So Bill kept saying to me, oh, you're going to get the call one day. I said, what, what, what are you talking about, a call? He said, no, he said, I'm not saying a word. So I said, okay, I could, kind of, I could sort of sense what was, going to, what was going to happen a little bit, but I could never prove it or whatever, so I just put it out of my mind. And then uh, I got the call 
from a uh, telephone call from Bill Kirbyshley, the Who's manager. Yeah. So, and he said, Kenny he said, I'll come straight to the point. He said, the, the Who have had a, a, a meeting and they decided to get together and they decided they, they would like you to join the band. And they're not, they're not, you know, they're not thinking about anyone else at all. They want you in the band. And they're not, in other words, they're not considering anyone else. Right, said, right. My, my reaction was, oh, I said, well, thanks, Bill. I said, but it's very flattering. It's very nice. I said, but I can't. And he said, he was, I could hear the, 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 the sort of gasp at the end of the phone, like a silence. He said, what? I said, I, said, I can't. Well, why? I said, because I've just been forming this band with, with, with a transatlantic band with Glyn Johns and, and that's it. Um, I said, that's what we're, we're excited about. And he said, he said, well, look, Pete's coming into the office this, uh, this evening, you know, early evening. Why don't you come and have a chat with Pete? I said, always happy, always happy to have a chat with Pete. It was always good to see Pete. So I said, oh, I come into the office, which is not far from him. So I went into the office and we sat there for about two hours, just having a great laugh, a glass of wine. And just talking about Australia, things we got up to, all kinds of stuff. A bit like we are. Yeah. And yeah. just having a great laugh. Yeah. Then Pete just went, just sort of went, you've got to join the band. You're a mod. You're one of us. <laughs> so, and I, saw, so I, kept, and I, saw, I felt so bad about it. I said, I said, well, I said all right, but I'm not copying Keith. I can't copy Keith. I said, I'm not only that. I can only do it. I can only ask my band if it's the right thing to do. If they say no, I'm not going to do it. And he said, yeah, no problem. So that evening I said, I'll, I'll, uh, I said, I'll go back and have a word with you. I was meeting the band anyway, that, 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 that same evening. So I went back and met the band and they were all over in England. So all of us together, Rios. And, and I said, look, the who have asked me to join them. I said, I, I'm not going to let everyone down here though. And they said, they were so gracious. So I said, Kenny, you've got to do that. You've got to do it. So I knew I was, I knew I was in a great company anyway, so right. that's how I, that, that made my mind up for me. Right. So I was relieved about that. And then, then I, I, I never, I was funny at the, at the deep end. I knew Keith Moon's kit, I knew it was big anyway, because I used to do the, in, in Australia and everywhere we played around Europe, Keith would never turn up for a sound check. So <laughs> I was always big, going, Kenny, do you want to play some drums for us? After our sound check. I said, well, you need all these bloody drums for anyway, you don't need all these. Right. <laughs> so that's so I was already used to it in a sense. I was already, already used to working with John and I used to work with Pete a lot. Roger not a lot because he, he was he was a singer in his own in his own right, so he never did sessions like that like we did. So I'm not, I'm not saying he did. I don't know what he did. Right. Can we talk about John Entwistle and you yeah. know one of the best bass players of all time? Uh, well, it was for me. It was like for me. It was like the fastest. Bass player in the world, but he's, even though he played bass, for me, we're in the who's like sitting between two lead, two lead guitarists, right? One one at the high end, one at the low end. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. What it was it? The only one that's playing bass was my bass drum. <laughs> you were the rhythm section. That was it. Just well, you, right? To be honest, yeah, I had a simple approach to it. But then again, I, I learned. To, I had very. I got a very fast foot, uh, uh, so I could do triplets on the on the on the on the bass drum. And because John was running really like, blah, 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 with his fingers. So I got to know, I got to do some triplets with him. In, in, I knew when they were going to be. So I go, blah, blah, with him. And John would look at me and go, oh. <laughs> so yeah, so that, was, that was kind of got, my foot got faster and faster. Right. So you, yeah. had, fa you had fast, you were doing triplets, oh. doubles on your foot. Yeah, you only, I don't, even though I had two bass drums set up in the hoop, yeah. right, one was only to hold the tom-toms on. Yeah. And, and my hi -hat, oh, yeah. Yeah. that's it the other one was uh, just a bomb pedal yeah. what were some of your memorable songs to play either live or in the studio with the who uh, well, I think I think I always used to love playing I used to love to when the, the ones I wore the cans with I used to love that with Barbara O'Reilly Who Are You and uh, Won't Get Fooled Again I, used to, I love the song Won't Get Fooled Again yeah. And I'll tell you what, that's becoming my epitaph, you see, because I won't get bored again. So. 
I love it. Yeah, we were wondering, uh, we were talking about when you were playing live, uh, did you have the cans in? Were you listening to that backing track uh, with Won't Get Fooled Again and Bubba O'Reilly? There, there, there were terrifying moments because Bob Pridden, who's our tour, we looked after all the monitors on tour. Bob, we, we go back so far. It's so funny. He's like one of the band. Yeah, the tape, uh, tape, uh, uh, quarter inch tape, in tape reel. So it was tape. So, and anything could happen that with Bob. It could stretch. Ooh, it could slow down. So, I mean, a couple of times it goes. Ooh. So, <laughs> so, uh, and you never knew if Bob would set the the the, the volume in the cans. No, so this too, too loud. For folks who do, who aren't realizing, this is all reel to reel tape, like analog yeah. actual yeah. tape. Nothing digital with them. Nothing digital. It's yeah. amazing. Anything could have happened. Exactly, and so anything did happen so a few times, you know. So I got <laughs> down, down with the tempo. Ooh, because what, what, the, the the band couldn't hear the the what was in my cans, so they had to play along to me. They can only hear it from what's coming out of the PA to, to keep it clean on stage. That's unbelievable. That's so. If I if I went out of time, they would go out of time. Was there a click? Um... Yeah. For you in the cans, yes, it was because when I, when I put my own click on, because don't forget, we were a very loud band, yes, and even with these massive headphones on, not they didn't have in ears, yeah. they, they were cans, right. Right. and because you're moving about all the time. Now, I know why Mooney used to put gaffer tape around his cans, right? <laughs> so I didn't resort to that, I've tied mine up, right? You were a little more stylish, it sounds I, like, right? I, I, I like to think so, yes, <laughs> so anyway, so. I put the cans on, and I what I do is I thought, what's the most annoying click I can put in there, so I can so I can always stay in time. And I overdub as my click, a cowbell, boom, boom, and it's like boom. So I, whatever happened, it was going boom. But it was, I, could, I could, I could, I could hear it all the time. Yeah. Well, we needed more cowbell, right, Kenny? That's yeah. that was the I, thing. I, no, I don't need a cowbell anymore because I can yeah. I know the song backwards and stuff. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> was it, you know, and you, you talk about whatever you want to talk about or not want to talk about, of course, but was it surprising to you? Cause I've read other parts uh, in, in books or articles of Roger really advocating for you at the beginning of like, if any oh, journalist, yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. If any journalist says he doesn't sound like Keith, he'll break his legs. But was that surprising to you? That well, the... I, th I think, to be honest, it was in the very early days. Don't forget, Keith had only been dead a matter of months. Right. And all of a sudden, I'm in there. So he looked, he looked, when I was excited, I learned all the songs and stuff like that. And it started out great. We were all playing. There's no problem. No, no problem whatsoever. It was, it was, the only hardest thing was remembering all those bloody songs. We're learning the repertoire. Right. And then we started to tour. And then suddenly... You know, I had my own sort of way of playing. And so I was kind of, I was a little bit more busier than I should have been because I, my comfort zone is playing a lot straighter than, than I should. But I said, I'm not going to copy Keith, and I never did. So I was a lot tighter. So it, probably Roger was missing certain key moments, drumming white drum fields and stuff like that, yeah. and bits and pieces like that. And then then, uh, then suddenly looked around, expecting to see Keith, and I, it was me. Right. I think... That's what got to him. And other, listening to other people saying, well, he's not like Keith. Of course, I'm not going to be like Keith. Nobody would be, right? No. No. So, Nobody so would be I, like you. I did my, I, what I did, I said to, to Pete in the first place, I said, look, I'm, obviously I'm going to, I'll be playing certain stuff because I like what Keith played in certain things. So I said, I'm going to try and do my best to do them in those certain places where I, I think any, in the, anyone in the right mind would want to do them. That's it. So I think we just, we kind of just sort of separated a little bit. So. And, and what was that like for you when that happened? Were you pissed off? Were you bummed out about, I mean, what, no, where did I mean, you go it, through? I, I was in a, in a sense, I came, I came to, uh, there's another phase in my life and I thought, well, you know, I didn't get chucked out of the band. I just, it was like, a, it was just like, we, we, we kind of broke up as soon as, couple of years later and then we reformed again and then we keep reforming and going on tour again and reform. So it's a bit, it's a bit like that. Yeah. So I was, my whole time with the Who spanned 10 years, which is quite a long time. Yeah. 
but then obviously we split up. Then I, I and I was forming a band with uh, Paul Rogers. Right, the law. That's when the law started. Yeah, so I was I was happy I was happy to be in the law and let the who do what they wanted to. Right, right, yeah. Um, <clears throat> if I could just ask before we go, I'd love to talk a little bit about the law too, if you have the time. But uh, Eminence Front one of my favorite Who songs of all time. Thank you for your music on that. Um, you have this, uh, and I don't know if you're counting when you're playing drums, but you have this hi-hat little splash or bark. Yeah. It sounds to me like it's on the ands. Uh, but can you say a little bit, how did you create that part, please? I just played me. I don't know. <laughs> okay. That's all I ever do is just play I me. I love it. See, you've got a drum kit, what happens is, the drum kit's always going to be amazing if it's tuned properly. But what makes it come alive is the player. It's the performance. So I don't know. Whatever I do, I try to analyse what I do, and I can't really. I just play me. I've never had a lesson, that's why. Otherwise, otherwise I could, funny enough, when I used to do session work, I used to back, do my own, write out my own, sort of fashion, in my own fashion of reading music, you know, writing music. Yeah, well, you're clearly a natural, Kenny, and uh, it's worked out, I think, really great. So, yeah. It's all um, in the book. It's all in the book. Look, it's, it's, all in the, it's all in the book. It went to number one. That yeah. must have been very gratifying. It was, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I said, no, it's going to buy my book. No one wants to know about boring old Kenny Jones. <laughs> but, well, um, I got it wrong. Yeah, definitely wrong. We all we all want to know about that. The other thing you've got going in, in addition to Let the Good Times Roll your book is the Small Faces uh, have just come out with an EP on vinyl. Can you tell us about that, please? This is the one. Look, look how young I am. Yeah. Oh, we all are. Can you lift Can you lift it up a little, uh, Kenny? Because I can't see it. Oh, yeah, I'll see, I'll see. yeah. How old are you in that picture? Uh, that's when. That's, yeah, hang on. That, that was I was probably sixteen. Sixteen. Amazing. Yeah. It's a real mod look. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a, 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 yeah, new <laughs> or re, a new or remastered. Yeah, it's remastered. And it's, it's, a, it's a different sort of clever thing to do. It wasn't my idea uh, to just put the four instrumentals that we did. Because we used to love playing Booker T and the MGs in that style in our own instrumentals. And it's a bit like that. You can yeah. hear all our influences on it. Well, well again. And the Small Faces were definitely a mod band, right? Oh, yeah, we, we were mod, yeah. Yeah. Okay, for folks who don't know, please tell us, what is a mod? Uh, someone young, someone really modern, thinking modern, and sort of, and sort of I don't know, just going, going against the grain, so sort of, not wanting to conform to what grown-ups do, right. that sort of thing. Yeah, so... so we're wearing colourful things. So for, for me, fashion and music have always gone together because we didn't know we, we we didn't know we were creating the the mods, the mods sort of look or the, the fashion. Because I grew I grew up just after the Second World War, and we were the first teenagers after the Second World War. So I grew up in the East End of London. Was, I grew up on bomb ruins, a place that had been bombed like mad. Mm. And so, uh, luckily, I never was I wasn't alive when. Uh, when it was going on, but I saw the aftermath of it, and everyone wore sort of black and grey, and it's definitely foggy old London town. I mean, you couldn't see a hand in front of your face, and I really mean that. Yeah. Um, so I, there was no colour. And you remember that uh, film that uh, Spielberg did with the, with, with the uh, war film he did, and it's all it's all black and white, yes. and then suddenly there's a little girl in a red coat walks on. Okay. What happened to me was a very similar thing. Um, I could, and it was surrounded by all this grey and black and what you know, stuff. And then I, well, I, I saw this shop, and in this shop was all these grey black suits and gone as well. And right there was a was a, a jump a caravel, so, uh, like a stay thing sort of jumper, bright red. Wow! And I went, I'm gonna have that. So I went in. A, uh, I didn't have enough money. It was in those days. It was old money. It's like. It was, a, it, was a, it was equivalent to sort of, I don't know, must have been five, six bucks or something. Mm. I didn't, didn't have that kind of money. It might be more. It's, anyone knows in old money, it's, it was about 30 bob. <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, 30 bob. One, one and a half quid. Yeah, so, that, so I saw this and I, I saved up enough money over a few weeks. So I got this red jumper on. 
And then I found some white Levi's. So that for me was the start of a fashion statement. Yeah. And the fact that I was wearing bright stuff, I couldn't, I, I love colors. I love wearing, although I've got ground today, and I'm, it's a great day outside. So I was dressing what the day is like. Anyway, so uh, I love color. I mean, I love bright jumpers, and bright muddy type sort of stuff that makes you feel happy when you look at them. Yeah, and definitely fashion was a big part of the mod scene, right? Um, and, and, and was that why there was such, I mean, even in the classic film Quadrophenia, uh, you know, the mods versus the rockers. What, yeah. was the, what was the trouble with you guys? What was the, what was the bad blood about? Well, we were all right. We just didn't like the way rockers looked. You know, <laughs> funny enough. Funny enough, the rockers, the scooter, you know the mod scooter we all sat on, the Vespas and the, and the Lambrettas, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the Italians brought them over when they came over from Italy to, and they opened up corner cafes, you know, sort of cheap sandwich shops and stuff like that. And they all, they brought the, the Lambrettas and the Vespas over. So the mods loved them. So, so you didn't have to have a whole driving license to get it. You can have a driving license at 16 right. so, for, for one of those. Yeah. So we're off we went. It's amazing. So the incredible times that were happening. Um, what have we not talked about, Kenny, that uh, we've got the small faces, vinyl, your book, Let the Good Times Roll. You mentioned the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before we started, that they just sent you something. Oh, yeah. What's happening there? They've just opened. Look, there's, there's, there's a six of us on there. Uh, it's an invitation to go to the Hall of Fame. If you can, fam- they if call you us can, family now. If you can lift that up for us real high, hey, Kenny, that'd be great. That's, that's the invitation. That's what, hang on, that's what the rock and roll, that's the new building. Got it? Even, oh, right. even higher, yeah, great. Yeah. Hang on. Now this one here is the invitation. Got it? Yeah. That's and this amazing. this one here is us. Incredible. Incredible. So you're, you're already a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes. When did that happen? That happened in 2012, I think. Wow. Well, what was that feeling like going? No, it's really, well, you know, it was one of the great things about it was uh, Glenn Johns was inducted at the same time as the producer. Wow. Wow. Awesome. And we spent, he was on the next table to me, and we just kept, we just kept saying, I'll be over in a minute for a drink and all that. And uh, we never got to see each, each, each other until the next day. It was very busy. Uh, yeah, very busy. Uh, parties afterwards, everyone knows what. Right. Definitely the after parties with that, right? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, the other fascinating thing about, for you that, I, that I've read on is your love of horses and playing polo. Yes, I'd love, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. And, and for you, are there any similarities to that and drumming? No, funny enough. No. It was, it was uh, I started to try to get into polo in 1970. Um, a guy called uh, Brian Morrison, who owned, and now, years later, he, he, owned, he, put, he built his own polo club. And, and I, we met in a, in a sort of, clothes shop somewhere, a reception somewhere, a champagne reception. And he said, oh, I'm a big fan. And he said, and we just talked, somehow when we were talking, horses came up. He said, oh, I'll just take that polo. I said, oh, great. And I lived near the, he said, I said, where is it? He said, Ham Polo Club. I said, oh, great. And that's near where I used to live in, in King, on Kingston Hill, which is not very far from it. He said, well, I'll tell you what, come up tomorrow and we can ride some of my horses. I said, great. So he said, when I get there, Ginger Baker was there. <laughs> he was just learning, at least I could ride. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like Ginger was learning to ride and hit the ball at the same time. And every time we look around, because we call it stick and ball, just practicing. So Ginger was off hitting the ball and then at a very slow pace. So the next minute we look around and then Ginger would be off his horse. So we had like a, a wild, wild bill, hickok sort of. I forget what they call American Western tassel thing. Yeah. And you can stick in the air, just running <laughs> after his horse. That's unbelievable. And, uh, yeah, so that was funny. Had you ever ridden a horse before? Did you ride as a kid? Well, 
people asked me what, what got me into horses, and it was Steve Merritt's fault, really. Uh-huh. Because we were rehearsing one day uh, in, I think I was about 14 or so, and we're in this pub in, in East London, and it's baking hot, boiling hot summer's day. So we arrived at the, 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 the rehearsal room, and he said, he said, it's, it's far too hot to rehearse today. So I'll fix, I'll fix this up with a friend of mine, and we're going to go riding in Epping Forest. I thought, great, I've never been on a horse, lovely. So we went off to Epping Forest, got on these horses, and I, I loved it, I thought it was great. So everyone else sort of fell off, and I stayed on, and I went back the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and that's how I got into horses. Is that right? Amazing. So you just fell in love with it. It was only inevitable that I would dis- discover the polo afterwards. Right. And now this isn't just taking a leisurely stroll on a horse. This is like no. playing Quidditch on a horse. You know, this polo, this is serious I, stuff, right? I, I ended up um, building my own polo club. And uh, we had two, with 200 acres uh, of polo club, six polo fields. And I just went nuts. My hobby went nuts. <laughs> so it kind of took me over. A little right. bit. So, and everyone thought he's given up. He's given up the, the drums for the saddle. I said, "No, I'm not giving up drumming. I'm just playing poets. And it's a hobby. Same right. as drums. I always think of drums as a hobby. Right. And so, and drums are, and polo is a hobby. Right. It's just I, I earn money from one, and one of them is my psychiatrist. Yeah, these are just very successful hobbies, right? That's, right. that's, so that's so, very yeah, cool. That's what happened. So I am, um, yeah. And then I ended so, up playing polo with Prince Charles as well. You know? yes. So he, he used to come down and play at my place. And we used to have great fun together. Then when the, the, his, the, the two princes were growing up, they were in the pony club. So they used to come down. We never used to tell, tell anyone they were there in the pony club. So they were just like kids. Right. And I watched them grow up all the time. It's amazing. And then we ended up, they ended up playing polo with my sons as well. Is that right? That's yeah. very cool. And why am I doing that? <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the it's big. right right exactly and, uh, and princess diana does she ever show up and play polo or ride horses as well no i did meet her though yeah um, uh in the early days because when we did live aid we had to be there in the morning for the opening ceremony and with lady Di and prince charles yeah and uh then nine o'clock in the morning we had to be there so got someone Unearthly Owl. That's what, that's, if my book is, it tells you my, my journey there to the opening, and then, because so, I'm in the, the Queen film as well, if you look at it, they show the large show of, of us in that, that particular moment, uh, when it was open. Say that again, you and Queen? Queen, you know the new film they've got? Yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah. yeah. Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Yeah. So if you look at the opening sequence when they talk about doing Live Aid, right? Yeah. That bit. They go to the bit where we, Prince Charles is there and the opening ceremony. Yeah. You can see me there. Oh, is that right? So I'm in the film. Very cool. I got to check that out. I, I've missed that. You have to go pause. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, drummers, that's a hard, uh, it's a hard thing physically after a while or even sometimes. And I imagine polo isn't easy either. Have you ever had any injuries, physical stuff? Yes, from I, 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 had, I had a fall and I, I had, a, they, they call it a, a cavalry, an old cavalry accident. So what happened was the horse went down and my foot was at a slight angle and the stirrup went like this on my foot. Mm. Broke my right foot, my bass drum foot. Wow. And it, it crushed, is my hand, it crushed everything in there, in my foot. Ouch. So the toes were not broken, just in, it's like, it's like so many fragments across there. Man. So that... I said to the surgeon who did it, who's, who's a great guy, I said, look, I don't care if I don't ride a horse anymore. I said, this is my bass drum foot and I want to play drums. He said, well, I'm a faces fan, so you're going to play drums. <laughs> Uh, All I, right. For six months, I had my foot in there, things <laughs> pins stuck in it, God knows well. Macy. Yeah, it's now faster than ever. Is it? You got yeah. a bionic foot? Yeah, it gets to the pub before I do. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And when, when did that happen? I'm glad you're okay. When did, when did this uh, yeah, accident? This happened about almost 20 years ago now. 20 years ago. Okay, great. So it's all healed and you're, you're the so bionic you man on you, I can tell you if it's going to rain tomorrow. Right. <laughs> right. I'm just raining now, my face. Yeah, yeah. You could feel the, the barometric pressure on this, right? Yeah. yeah. 
That's amazing. You you have lived quite a life, sir. It's uh, pretty incredible. Um, you tell me if you want to talk about this or not. But um, you know, one of your in the time with the Who, obviously the tragedy at Cincinnati happened. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that breaks my heart. Now. Yeah, I guess I wondered from your perspective, your thoughts and feelings about all of this at this uh, point. Well. What happened was the um, the the promoter was given uh, insurance. Uh, uh, Bill Kirby, the, ma the manager, fixed up extra insurance on that particular gig to make sure that everything, everything was going to go right. I don't think the promoter did his job properly. Mm. Not saying any more about it, but uh, the one of the doors, a few more doors, are supposed to be left open. There's only one door open at the front there and a coach came in late because we already started playing so they they wanted to get the, they heard the music rush down the stairs and into, like that to get to the auditorium and one fell over the other one fell over and that's how it happened yeah but the, the families were because afterwards you know the press was saying do you feel guilty you you know do you, you you've caused this accident we, i said well, no, we, we've not caused it right. you know so we were questioned. We had to go back to Cincinnati months later and be questioned by everybody. You got, you got questioned. Yeah. Hmm. And so um, the, the, the family sent us some lovely letters. They, they just lost their loved ones. Yeah. And they, you know, they said, you know, we don't blame you at all. They were going to see a band that they love. And so very gracious, every one of them. Yeah, and they're... There's this uh, heartwarming video online on YouTube with Roger going back and, yeah. and visiting with some of the families as That's well. Right. But, uh, you know, it must have been awful for you guys. It was awful for them and the families. But for you, you're right. Well, Nothing when, we, when we were told, uh, usually we do an encore and stuff like that. Bill Kirby, when we came off stage, when we finished, waiting in the wings to do or our usual thing, waiting in the wings to do, come back and do an encore. But Bill Coach said, well, come on straight, come straight to the dressing room. Went straight to the dressing room. That's when he said, see, I've got some bad news. He said, he said, we had a few people died today. I think it was, a, I can't, I think it was 11 people died. Wow. I can't remember now. But the, I think it was 11. Yeah, it no. was 11. And um, I, we said, how did it happen? He said, well, we, we didn't know. He said, well, they rushed for the stage and fell down. And uh, suddenly again, that shock of the, water, the room filling up with water, going those right the car. And uh, he's just talking away. And so we just, we're so, all of us were dying. We couldn't, we were speechless. We couldn't, didn't know what to say, do. So we rushed back to that. We were rushed back to the hotel, told us, we were told to lock ourselves in the room, don't let anyone in. And got, somehow the press got hold of my, got hold of a pass key from the maid or something. Next minute, the door burst open in my room. And lights and flashing and got those cameras. Wow. It's Awful. Really, it's one of those days. It, it will never leave me. That thought of that will never leave me. And I always feel so, feel so much for the families. And so, you know, yeah. they're losing that such a great member of their family. No question. Yeah, I mean, a, a tragedy for, for everybody. Yeah. And I think it, it did change the way concerts were... Because you guys had no idea even before and during your show that this no. had happened, right? There's funny enough, that I knew something was up because I, usually you get people on the side of the stage in the wings watching, and it was bare. Yeah, so so very unusual. Very unusual, a bit spooky. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Anyway. Sad stuff, sad yeah, stuff. That happened in the very early days of me being in the band. So that, didn't that, was, that was, yeah, 1979, right? Yeah. And you write about this in your book. Yeah. Yeah. Anything in the book we haven't covered, Kenny, you've been so gracious with your time. Anything that you want to say before we wrap up that? No, not really. I think to be honest, I've covered most things in the book, yeah. you know, uh, I, cause I, I don't, I'm only going to write one book and that's it. Uh, although I do feel another book is once I finish the book, I kept thinking, oh, I should have put that in. I didn't put that in. I didn't put that in. So I thought, oh, no, I've done mine. So let them use their imagination. Right. I, might, I might do a short one. This is the bits I left out. Right, exactly. Because you're, you're still playing drums, right? You're, yeah. You've got the Jones gang going on? Yeah, we had, funny enough, we had a hit record in America as well. 
we had a, we had a number one song so, called Angel. Angel? When was yeah, that? It was about, must have been about 12, 15 years ago. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And are you still playing drums now? I can never stop playing drums. It's hard, but <laughs> I that's what it. I do. Look, sticks, <laughs> so, practice pad, right here. Yeah, I got mine right here. So. <laughs> good man, good man. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, uh, man, Kenny, the, the book is called Let the Good Times Roll. Uh, congratulations just on all your success. And I just want to say a heartfelt thanks for, for me and from Doug. Uh, you got any more questions, Doug? I, I just... My friend Doug has a question, I think. Yeah, I, I, come I, on I in, Doug. Up. Come over, over <laughs> trying, here. Trying to line up. Yeah. Kenny, I just wanted to tell you... The first time I ever saw The Who live was on the HBO special from the Slits Rusks America yeah. Yeah. special. And back then, like HBO came on at like three o'clock in the afternoon. And I was probably around 14 years old. And we were so excited for this concert to come on. So you were the first drummer I saw with The Who. I didn't know really? anything about the faces at that time. I didn't know anything. But my brother had the um, It's Hard album. Oh, yeah, so, uh, and I loved Athena. Yeah. And yeah. cry if you want. Oh, I must have worn cry if you want. I love cry if you want. It's great. Yeah. 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 So the, anyways, that inspired me. I, I became a drummer as well over the years. Oh, good. I'm glad and, I've been useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and anyways, just just the the impact that you had, I just I just have to thank you. Um, oh, I probably that. watched that concert uh, uh, yeah. uh, countless times. I ended up getting it on VHS when it came out. <laughs> and... Um, Funny enough, uh, my band said, you know, the Jones guy said, I think we should do You Better, You Better. And I thought, yeah. okay, great. So we started to play it. And I, I, I said to my wife afterwards, I said, do you know, I couldn't keep up with myself. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great song to play. It's an amazing song to play. I love it. It's great. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. Man, this has been, this is... This has been just a real blast. Kenny, thank you so much for your time and a pleasure. heartfelt thanks for all your music. It's a real pleasure. I'm really too pleased to be interviewed by you. Thank you.